This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Welcome back for another installment of the Stanford HCI seminar. It's, you know, often when I think, of, when people talk to me and I say, oh, I'm doing academic work, and somebody's from industry, they, they go and they say, you know, Scott, in, in academia, you, you just build toy systems there. It's not, you, you need to understand the problems of, of real data that you just don't see those in the academic context. And what I really like about Ed's work is that for years now, he's been working at the intersection of HCI, of information visualization, and of databases. And Ed's got real data. He's going to show you some slides where you go, yep, you know, you're, you're, you're trolling through the real deal, through all of Wikipedia, through all of other large sources. And what, what Ed and his colleagues at Park do is really impressive to me because, you know, it's, it's operating at the scale of the web, which is pretty darn big. So with that, Ed Chi. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, so today I'm going to be telling you a little bit of the work uh, of a new research area at Palo Alto Research Center. Just out of curiosity, how many of you know Park? All right, so you guys actually pay attention to history. That's pretty cool. Um, so the group that I was originally in was called User Interface Research Group. So you know Park obviously is very well known for a lot of user interface research in their uh, 70s and 80s, uh, particularly around um, the Alto and the personal computing and Ethernet and whatnot. And um, that group actually uh, recently split up into two. And uh, one group is called Human Information Interaction. And the other group, as you might have guessed it, is called Augmented Social Cognition. And you know, you'll say, Augmented Social Cognition, what does that mean? Okay, And uh, that seems like really academic. So part of the beginning of this talk is going to be telling you a little bit about what we mean by this field and then showing you examples of the kinds of things that we've been doing uh, in this area. And uh, my group now is consists of seven people, uh, Peter Paroli, Li Chen Hong, Fang Wang Su, Les Nelson, Rowan Narn, and Raluca Badul. And um, so that's right, get to it. Um, so as Scott mentioned, um, I, my work in the past has actually been uh, a lot in this area called information foraging. So for people who are are familiar with HCI at least, um, probably know something about that this is a fairly um, academic theory about how people search for information. And I've done a lot of work in the area called information scent, which is the idea of looking at information and the kind of cues that ga they give off in the information environment, and then what kind of behavior then you can predict from actually um, ecological equations. So it turns out that a lot of the equation from information uh, from ecology, the study of ecology, how people move from patch to patch as they search for food is, is turns out to be very similar to the way that in, uh, people forage for information. So as part of that work, um, what I've been focusing on is an environment like this. Um, so um, this is my actual office at Park, and uh, first you'll notice that it's really messy. <laughs> The second thing you'll notice is that I have six screens in front of my desk. And the reason for that was because how many of you hate working on an uh, air airline tray? In fact, you guys have a tray in front of you right now. How many of you hate doing that? Well, have you noticed that the laptop is about the size of the same size as the lap as an airline tray table? So why do we confine ourselves when we're in front of the desktop, desktop to the size of an airline tray table. I mean, more accurately, maybe we should be calling their airline tray table computing devices. Um, so one of the things that we did was to go and replicate the experience of what it would be like to have a, an actual desk on your computing desktop. Right? And um, I have, for a while, I had carpal tunnel syndrome, so I have a special keyboard and all that. And so this was my world. This is what I had worked on for many, many years. And the question had been, um, 
what can we do to enhance this kind of environment? And then um, I probably spent about 10 years worth of my uh, research life in this space. And then, um, then I realized that um, um, I've been working in, in kind of the wrong area. And uh, that's kind of depressing after 10 years. Uh, well, the thing that I realized was that humans are social animals and that to study individual foraging doesn't really quite make sense because people forage in a social context. And so, um, in fact, I wanted to give you an example of this. Um, I, got, uh, I recently just got married uh, in October of, of last year. So, um, and a couple weeks before um, uh, my wedding, uh, we got news from from my wife's uh, family saying that uh, his father has just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, if any of you know anything about pancreatic cancer, this is about the worst news you can possibly get. Pancreatic cancer has a survival rate after one year of about ninety, uh, of about five percent, and after two years, about one percent. Um, and very few people live beyond five years. Um, it is one of the deadliest cancer I've, uh, that you can possibly get, and uh, you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy, basically. And um, so what happened was, like any good research scientist, what you start doing is you research about it, right? So you, I started reading academic paper, I started reading medical journals about pancreatic cancer, and I started bookmarking all this stuff on, of all places, delicious. And um, Several months later, while I'm giving the first version of this talk at a workshop um, uh, at, um, in Colorado, uh, where Scott was attending as well, um, I get this email in, literally in the middle of this workshop, right? And, and I was trying to control my emotions and not to literally just cry right there. And this, there's this guy on the web, he said that he has been searching on Delicious for pancreatic cancer stuff, and he says, I'm a fellow Delicious user, and I'm here with my dad who has just been diagnosed a little over a year ago with pancreatic cancer and is at the tail end of things. And I've learned a lot through his treatment and what's out there, and I don't know if it's something that you or your family has, just, you know, he just noticed that I was bookmarking a lot of pancreatic cancer stuff, and just said, I want, just wanted to drop you an email and be well. The amazing thing with this is that if you're a delicious user, you know that you don't put your email address up there. So he, this guy spent some time figuring out who I was, you know, Googled me and, you know, find my email address and then took, you know, at least five minutes to write an email to me. And that, that was really touching to me. And uh, that was really kind of the thing that underscored this whole social foraging idea to me. Um, and of course, the more academic way to explain all this is to look at what actually happens with real data. And so if you look at Wikipedia, according to Alexa.com, um, going from the 10,000th ranked website to about the 7th or the 8th ranked website over a very short period of time, three years or so, it's just absolutely amazing. If that still doesn't convince you, there's this other piece of statistics that marketing folks likes to talk about, which is called daily reach. Um, and uh, the idea of the daily reach is out of 100 people, how many people end up at that medium? Okay, so you can say, what's the daily reach of radio? What's the daily reach of CNN.com, for example? So it turns out that this blue line down here is the daily reach of CNN.com, one of the biggest media companies, right, around, around the world probably. And it has a daily reach of about a little bit less than 2%. In fact, it was decreasing when I looked it up. And it's, uh, when I looked it up, it was a, on a daily reach of about 1%. That is, there's roughly about 100 people in this room right now. One of you probably visited CNN.com, you know, on average, according to the statistics. And um, for comparison, Wikipedia, uh, when I looked it up, had a daily reach of about 7%. Okay. And just in case that you're still wondering what does that mean, you know, um, Yahoo and Google roughly has about 33% each. So that's... That's the scale that we're talking about, roughly. So when you look at the kinds of collaboration that happens on Wikipedia like this, um, on, the, on one end of the collaboration spectrum, you have these really sophisticated sort of collaborative knowledge workspaces like Wikipedia. And um, they are really interesting. So I'm a big snowboarder fan. Uh, and 
every winter I spent almost all my weekends up in Lake Tahoe. And uh, last season, every time I came back, I kept getting wind burn, and I didn't know what that was. And so then I went on the web, and I Googled and Yahooed and, you know, spent a lot of time figuring out what wind burn is. And uh, it turns out that there wasn't a Wikipedia entry on, for it. And uh, wind burn, if I explain it to you, it really becomes really obvious. It turns out it's not just sunburn. It's actually a combination of, yes, there's a little bit of sunburn element to it, but the most part of it is actually microabrasion of the face, which is basically tiny little ice particles in the air brushing against your face. That's what causes wind burn. And um, it, th the way to think about it is basically you're getting a free facial. <laughs> okay? and, um, and so anyways, it took me half an hour to find this out. And so I thought, well, I noticed that it wasn't available on Wikipedia, or at least there was just a little entry on it. And so I added some information in it. And lo and behold, other people started adding to it. That's really the spirit of the kind of this high-end collaboration that's really happening, people coming together to form a new knowledge space. And then at the middle part of this, you have systems that sort of evolve structures that can be organized, that can be used to organize information. So if you spend some time browsing on Flickr as an example, right? I mean, it's like it's not just you organizing your photograph; it's everybody else also organizing their photograph, and all that is combined together. So when you go and search for the word Colorado as an example, you find all the other people who have labeled their picture with the name Colorado, and if uh, if you go on there and look for uh, the word HCIC, where the workshop that we're at, you'll find all the other participants who have uploaded their photos um, for that year. Uh, and so you can sort of use this as a way to collaboratively organize information. And then finally, you have these lightweight social processes like um, dig.com or delicious, which is really a way to increase the signal to noise ratio. It's the way you want to think about a voting process that helps you identify what information is, is faddish. And there are a lot of examples of this, um, but the most popular, well, not no, the most well-known story behind this is if you uh, have read the book Wisdom of the Crowd. Um, in it, pretty much like right off the bat, it tells this interesting story of having a group of farmers to guess the weight of an ox. Uh, and it turns out that the average of the guesses was better than any single guess in the room. Okay, so we, in fact, we can do this experiment if we wanted to right now. You know, have all you guessed my weight, and the average of that guess turns out to be pretty accurate. Um, and so there were. The median is uh, I'm sorry. The median is better. Uh, well, there's some debate about that, but. Um, uh, it turns out that this was a phenomenon that was uh, examined uh, in the 1860s um, and it was published actually, I think, in a royal, you know, uh, in the Royal Society Journal and whatnot. So anyways, um, the point is that there's all these different kinds of collaboration systems now um, on the web. And in fact, when you think about PageRank, it turns out PageRank is kind of a version of a vote uh, uh, voting machine, right? So when I, when I actually write a web page and I say this web page should be linked to that page, it's a, it's a vote for the authority of that page and therefore um, use that as a sorting mechanism. So you have voting systems on one end um, and then you have Wikipedia on the other end and all kinds of system you know, sort of in between. And it turns out that if you really want to understand all this stuff, um, how it works, uh, there's a lot of interesting theories out there um, that are slowly being aggregated together to really understand how all this stuff works. So you have things like the understanding of micro and behavioral economics, which is uh, especially led by a lot of work by uh, uh, Bernardo Huberman at HB Labs and uh, Lada Edimic, who is now at the University of Michigan. Um, you have recent books, popular books like Wisdom in the Crowd, Long Tail, and all these books that have come out, Freakonomics and Wikinomics and all these Pretty, people come up with pretty amazing names for these books. Um, and then you have like obscure inf uh, theories that people have been working on for many years, things like uh, information cascade. So the idea of information cascade is that it turns out you could study how information is passed from one person to another person without being verified. And it's kind of basically the study of rumor mail and how it works. And uh, Anderson and Hole has done some really interesting work in this space. And then 
uh, at the space of social network analysis, I think um, uh, uh, one of the HCI students here, um, Don Tan, was just telling me about uh, uh, his work in social network analysis as an example of the kinds of things uh, in this space. And uh, it turns out that there's been a lot of uh, business professors who's done interesting work in this area, like Ronald Burr, who's done work in structural whole, which is the idea that you want, it, it turns out that people who are, um, brid who bridge between research groups, that are people who do interdisciplinary work, um, are often the ones that are paid the, the best. And people who transmit ideas between research groups are often the ones that are the most well respected. And so there's this problem that you, then why doesn't everyone become an information broker? And um, so he's gone and actually studied this uh, uh, in an academic context. And then you have the understanding of conflict and coordination, which is um, there's a lot of uh, early work in this area of how do you do decision making, problem solving, community networks, um, people who studied muds and moose uh, back in the early 90s. Um, and uh, really academic work like Invisible Colleges by Pamela Sandstrom, et cetera. So anyways, I don't have time to go over all this stuff. I'm just telling you that there's a whole lot of stuff in this space, and I'm just giving you a glimpse of the kinds of things that we're doing. And um, so the, at least the research vision that we're trying to get to, this idea of augmented social cognition, is that um, um, it turns out that if you look up the definition of cognition, um, I, I've been at Park for 10 years, and uh, I work with two, two of some of the best cognitive psychologists in the field, and I, I never bothered to spend time looking up the definition of, of, of cognition. And when I looked it up, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, it, it's a really beautiful definition. The ability to remember, think, and reason, the faculty of knowing. Um, and when I looked that up, I was like, wow, you know, that's, that's really profound. Um, so then I looked up the definition of social cognition and uh, thinking that it would mean the thing that I would imagine it to mean. And it turns out psychologists use uh, the word social cognition, the phrase social cognition, for a very different pr uh, problem. They talk about social cognition as in my cognition about pro social processes. That is, uh, think about teenage girls in junior high school, you know, like, Susie likes Mary, and, so, and Susie is a very popular person, so I should get to know Susie. So that kind of thought process is what's known as, um, in psychology field as being social cognition. But actually, what I think a better definition of it that would encompass that kind of cognition as well is this idea of social cognition, the ability of a group of people to remember, think, and reason. So now you can understand what um, augmented social cognition means, which is the enhancement of a group of people and their ability to remember think and reason, okay? So that's really kind of what I mean, that to spend that 15 minutes just to explain to you this whole area that we're trying to go down toward. Um, so one of my heroes is this guy named John Tukey, uh, who is a statistics powerhouse. <laughs> that's the only way to describe him. And um, he actually, in the, uh, in the early days of PARC, um, I only have secondhand uh, accounts of this um, actually consulted at Park uh, pretty often. And uh, one of the things that he used to always tell people when they brought a statistics problem to him is, have you plotted the data? You know, just the raw data, please. You know, none of this analysis. I don't want to see any of it. I just want to see the raw data. And uh, he's very well known for just keep saying that the first step to solving any important problem is get a big piece of paper and some pencil and just start plotting your data. And so so about a year and a half ago, two years ago, when we started going down this road of trying to understand the space, my idea was just, well, what's some of the biggest collaboration spaces can we get the data for and let's just stop, uh, start plotting some data. And so that's what we did. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some characterization studies that we've done in the space. Uh, and um, the, the two things that if, I'll definitely get to the first one, I might not get to the second one. But uh, I want to tell you a little bit about coordination costs in Wikipedia. And this is joint work with some of my staff members and an intern uh, at the time uh, of my uh, Enneke Couture. And um, so the next part here, I wanted to show you a, a cute little, um, see if I can do this. Let's see.
Oh, that's uh, uh, Anchor Wat. Um, I just uh, I went there recently, uh, about two years ago, and one of the most amazing places to to uh, to visit, in fact. So okay. Hopefully, the audio for this works um, because I just I find one of the things about research is that um, is that you you have to find things that really crack you up and. Uh, this thing, I should have gotten this ready for you. Yeah, right. it's the best thing Is ever. The audio coming through? Anyone in the world can write anything they want about any... Wikipedia is the best thing ever. Anyone in the world can write anything they want about any yeah, subject. Right. So you know right. you are getting the best possible but, uh, information. How many of you know this, this guy? Uh, from the office. Wikipedia is the best thing ever. Anyone in the world can write anything they want about any subject. So you know you are getting the best possible information. Good idea. All right. See if this works. It's just so priceless. I have to take the time for it. Wikipedia is the best thing ever. Anyone in the world can write anything they want about any subject. So you know you are getting the best possible information. <laughs> Isn't that just priceless? I, I think it's just so great. Um, so I, I just want, I have to spend a couple of minutes just to show you that. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, this is a hotly debated item now, you know. Wikipedia is the best thing ever. Anyone in the world can write anything they want about any subject. And that's why you're getting the best information. There's so many layers of irony and problems and, and, and truth and just everything lay, layered on this one single statement. Uh, it's just amazing to have a comedian in a popular TV show to summarize some of your research, you know, in five seconds. Uh, for those of you who are PhD students, you know how a lot of people tell you that that by the time you gradu uh, graduate, you have to be able to explain your your research area in about 15 seconds, like in the time it takes to ride the elevator. It's the best is when you have a comedian who can do that for you. Um, so that's more or less the kind of thing that we're trying to go after, trying to understand. You know, is Wikipedia the best way to do this? You know, do you, that to get the best information? Because anybody can write anything they want on Wikipedia. And so the way we, the approach we took to understanding these coordination costs and the quality is, um, is by brute force, by this John Tukey method. So we took the entire dump of Wikipedia, all 800 gigabytes worth of it, um, on July 2nd, 2006. By the way, that has grown to about 1.6 terabytes now. Uh, about a, a little over a year after that. That's about uh, 58 million revisions, 4.7 million wiki pages, 2.4 million article pages, and um, you know, not the entire web, but pretty big. Um, just in case you don't know a little bit about Wikipedia, I just wanted to spend like two minutes real quick to give you a quick view of what Wikipedia is about. So most of the time, people know about these kinds of pages. These are called article pages, that is, if you want to know about George Bush, you go there and you know, there is a whole article about him and all the different things that he's been involved in. And, um, but there are also these things that are um, what are called discussion pages. So for example, one of the major problems on George W. Bush's page was about the fact that um, he, as some of you might know, uh, was involved in a DWI incident. And the, the, a major controversy on Wikipedia was, was the age in which he, the, uh, on the day he was arrested for that, was that an important fact for the article or not? Okay. This was a hugely controversial issue. And um, so w what happens is people go on the discussion page to talk about uh, these, these uh, issues. And then uh, this actually ends up spilling over to the user pages. That is, any user who is engaged in that discussion can then be, uh, people can leave messages for them and say, you know, why do you take this position, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then eventually that also 
um, end up in these things called procedural pages. That is, it turns out that in order to um, govern how these conflicts can be resolved, et cetera, there's a whole set of procedure for how to make that happen. There's arbitration committees. There are people who are on, um, in these groups called the mediation cabal. Um, they are, um, uh, there's three revert rule. That is any, so it's kind of like in chess, you can't make the same move multiple times before you kind of uh, have to forfeit the game, basically. Uh, in Wikipedia, it's the same thing. You can't revert the same edit more than three times, and you kind of get a timeout. And so there are all these kinds of uh, procedural pages. And then um, uh, finally, when uh, dispute pages uh, are uh, boil over such that the procedures don't work. There's actually discussions about these procedures, whether they need to be changed, etc. Okay, so that's the kind of environment that we're dealing with. And um, what I want to show you real quick is uh, this paper that we published in Kai 2007 about the kinds of coordination conflict that happens on Wikipedia. And I want to tell you about conflict that happens at the global level and the article level. I won't have time to talk about the, uh, the user level, so if you are interested in that, um, feel free to look up the, the publication. So the first thing that we did was, as I said, the Tukey method, is to just simply map what has happened. And um, it turns out that if you look at edits that actually go to article pages, uh, starting from the moment Wikipedia more or less became public all the way up to the summer of 2006, you see that the proportion of edits uh, has gone down. So uh, at first it was you know, in the high 90%, um, and now down to the, the summer of 2006, about 70%. Okay. So that's the first direct evidence that we know that there's a lot of coordination that are happening as the information is sort of growing and getting bigger. And um, then, what, so why what are some of those percentages going toward? Uh, well, one thing is that there is an increase in users talking to each other. So um, it's, that has gone up to about 8%. And um, there is also a lot of discussion about procedures, as I mentioned. And uh, that has kind of been steady going up and then kind of plateaued or come down a little bit. And then that's at about 11% these days. And um, there are also a lot of maintenance work. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, reverts of uh, vandalism, a lot of uh, reverts on people who are making you know, edits that really don't make a lot of sense, maybe on, on topics that don't really fit in. Uh, so in fact, one of the surprising things about Wikipedia is that how little vandalism really happens. On average, about one to two percent of the vandal uh, of the edits on Wikipedia is vandalism, and um, the first question you're going to ask about that is why is that so? I mean, because this is such a popular place to be, or at least to get information. You would think that everybody is going to be putting up their Viagra ads, <laughs> right? And uh, it turns out the reason is because on average, um, any edit on Wikipedia survives no uh, any spamming or vandalism edits on Wikipedia don't really last longer than a couple of minutes, typically on eight minutes on average. At least that's the latest statistics that we know from 2005, 2006 or so. So that's a reason why vandalism don't really survive. So uh, at the global level, this is kind of a visualization, uh, a, a chart that uh, just tells you kind of what's been going on. This is uh, about 65% here. I just chopped it off so that you can see some of the dynamics in here. And you can see that uh, for article pages, you know, pretty steady decrease down to about 65%. And then there's all these other, this is basically each, each time slice here is a, a uh, uh, pie chart, right? So at any given moment in time, you can take a slice and you say, okay, at that moment in time, how many edits are going into user talk? How many edits are going into article? How many edits are going into maintenance, et cetera? And so this is the direct evidence that there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen in order to keep moving Wikipedia uh, forward because just the pure amount of number of people who are participating and the pur pure, uh, pure number of uh, edits that are going into it. Okay, so the next thing that you're going to ask about is um, where do these conflicts happen? Where do these kinds of coordinations happen? Um, so conflict at the article level, we um, 
we have some idea about where they are. But one problem that we ran into when we did this research was what defines conflicts at the local level? You know, what, what, do we mean, what do we mean by a conflict? Who determines what is a conflict and what is not a conflict? So when someone puts in a comma and someone says, no, the comma shouldn't be there, and he reverts it, well, does that count as a conflict? Well, probably not. But the kinds of conflict that we were talking about, what are the age of uh, George Bush uh, getting his DWI? Uh, is that an appropriate conflict? Yeah, well, that's probably a kind of conflict that you would count as being conflict. So one major, major problem we had in doing this research was just first figuring out what we mean by conflict. And um, luckily, human uh, subject ratings kind of comes to the rescue. It turns out that um, on, in Wikipedia, there are these things called controversial tags. Um, so any moment in time, anybody, doesn't have to be an administrator or anybody, can go to a, an article and say, this is a con I believe this is a controversial topic. And what has happened so far means that it's controversial. And so you can just go there and say, you know, open bracket, uh, controversial, and a little, uh, close bracket. And um, that now that article has been marked as controversial, and you get this little banner on that page uh, on that article. And it tells you that this is a controversial topic, and it's under dispute, blah, blah, blah. And anyone who disagrees and says, no, it's not a controversial topic, uh, I don't think there's been enough conflict, can go there and remove it. Okay, so it's kind of like a voting mechanism. So how long this thing, this controversial tag stays on, um, is is also could be controversial in itself. Okay, uh, but it does the the fact that it gets added and removed, added and removed is also another measure of controversialness of the of the article. Ironically, anyway, the the point is that we wanted to come up with a measure of how controversial a, a, a topic is, and the way uh, we ended up doing that was for an article. Imagine that it has you have two articles. One article has had 10 edits. Uh, the other article also has 10 edits. But during that period of time, um, three, uh, eight edits here are marked as controversial, whereas this article only had two edits that were marked as controversial. So we call this uh, uh, the controversial revision count. Okay? And so the idea is just that article one here most likely are more controversial than article two. And so this is just kind of a rough measure of controversy. Yeah. So you're measuring time in terms of number of revisions rather than the amount of, um, rather than real time? Yeah, that's a good question. We debated about that. And um, we didn't come up with, we had arguments for both directions, and so we just picked one. <laughs> one of the things when you're trying to do characterization of this type, you know, you, you, you can't spend, you know, hours just debating on every decision. You say, okay, let's just plot the raw data. Try it one way and see what happens. And that's what we did. But that's a fair question. Um, then what we did was we said, okay, what are the, some of the other things that might indicate conflict? So for example, uh, the more revisions that article has gone under, maybe means that it's controversial. Uh, maybe the more edits that have gone into the discussion page means that it's controversial. Um, well, maybe actually it's the page length. The, the longer the page, the more likely that it will be controversial. Or maybe it's how many people have participated in the conversation. So if 100 people are participating in, con in the conversation, maybe that means it's more controversial. Another thing that a lot of people have been talking about in the press especially was this idea of anonymous edits. This is probably one of the most controversial uh, uh, design decisions for Wikipedia, which is the fact that, I, in fact, right now I'm just I'm hooked up to the Stanford network, and I I have an IP address, and I can just go on there and click on edit, and I can edit a Wikipedia page. So that's called an anonymous edit because the only thing that links that to the person who made the edit is the IP address. There's no credentials. There's no nothing. Um, and so those are called anonymous edits. So you might su suspect that the more anonymous edit an article gets, the more likely that it might be controversial. So um, what we did was we correlated essentially the controversial revision count metric that I just told you about. And with all these different possible metrics um, that, uh, that we have been discussing. Okay. And um, then what we did was we did a, a, a classic uh, machine learning technique called a support vector machine. 
and basically just if you don't know what that is, it's, it's just basically a regression. Okay, so um, so we plotted uh, the the regression, and this is what it looks like, and we get an R square of uh, of about uh, 0.89. So that means that we are you able to use this kind of machine learning uh, uh, approach to try and figure out what is essentially doing a factor analysis. If for those of you who know a little bit about statistics of what factors really contribute a lot to controversialness. And um, just by the way, uh, you, pretty much if you know anything about power, power law, you kind of already can guess that this kind of looks like a power law distribution. And then of course, you're also wondering probably what this one point is all the way over on the other, what's it doing all the way on the other side of the plot? Uh, by the way, how many of you uh, are starting to guess what that point might be? Um, when we saw this plot, the thing, first thing I thought was, gotta be abortion. Oh no, wait a minute, maybe it's Iraq war. No, 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 no. Maybe it's, you know, I just, uh, maybe it's like religion. It's like, why is it? Maybe it's politics, presidential politics. And um, so it turns out um, it's the embodiment of all of those. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, yeah. this, <laughs> No other president probably is as, as controversial as George Bush, and he's just all the way on the other side. Um, I, I don't really understand how you can say this, he's a mainstream president if he's all the way on the other side like that. Um, so pretty ironic. Um, but remember all those different features I told you about? And it turns out when you do that factor analysis, these are the things that sort of roughly predict what might be controversial in Wikipedia. Um, Yes, the number of revision to the talk page, that is the more discussion it has, tends to increase its controversialness. Uh, the number of minor edits to the talk pages, people who said, I think your idea sucks, you know, that kind of comments. Uh, the more you have that kind of short, not really constructive conversations, um, the more controversial it is. Um, the more unique, uh, the, the, uh, the more unique editors to the talk page, decreases controversialness. Wow, that's interesting. So that suggests that the more people participate in the discussion, unique people, okay, the less controversial it, it becomes. Um, number of revisions to an article increases controversialness, that makes sense. Again, the number of unique editors to the article page also decreases controversialness. So again, providing evidence that the more people participate in the discussion, the more likely that to reach consensus perhaps and, and, and not have it be controversial. The more anonymous edits to the talk page increases controversialness, but the more con anonymous edits to the article page decreases controversialness. Very interesting. That suggests that, that people who add their voices to the article page, anonymous edits, people perhaps people like you who don't care about signing up for an account, don't really particularly care for participating in the online community, but have something to say about something. Typically, your edits actually seems to be adding to the article and it's not marked as controversial. Um, whereas anonymous edits to the talk page, people who don't care to sign on and just want to add their two bits uh, in the discussion tend to increase the controversialness of the, of the topic. So, Anyways, uh, these are just the kinds of initial things that we found that you know, really puzzles us and, and f make us think about what, what's going on. Yeah. Are, aren't you supposed to not sign talk, uh, sign talk edits and not sign article edits? Uh, yes, they're not signed, but in the edit log, you can find out exactly who made it. Right. So, uh, Basically, nothing on Wikipedia is essentially completely uh, opaque, right? Because you can always trace back to an, at least an IP address. That's the minimum level that they have decided, right? That's the level in which you can at least get to. One of the things that you might be asking here at this point is, well, you, you've, uh, if you know anything about machine learning, well, you, the, the question you might be asking is, well, you've only trained it on the set of articles that have been marked as controversial at all, right? So what about all those different articles that have not been marked controversial? So one of the things that we did was we took all the untagged articles that, are more, that have more than 100 edits, and then we simply um, ran our machine learning, this, this predicted model, 
on these articles and figure out what articles might be uh, in conflict. And then we took those articles and sampled them. And then we asked Wikipedians whether these articles are indeed controversial according to our prediction, even though they have not been marked as controversial, and asked them how controversial those articles actually are. And it turns out that we get a pretty good correlation with these surveys that we did. Uh, one of the things, by the way, when we did the survey that was very interesting was the fact that um, when we surveyed these group of people who, are called media who belong to the mediation cabal, they're happy as peach to help us out. We did, this, we did the survey on ourselves, that is, we conducted a pilot survey on ourselves just to see how long it takes to fill out the survey. And it takes, for us, for each individual, individual survey, it took us about 45 minutes. So I thought, oh, that's a reasonable workload for people to you know, help, help out research, you know, help out academic research. And so we put the survey out there, and um, pretty soon we're getting these replies back from the mediation cabal people. And one person spent 40 hours filling out the survey. We basically got a PhD thesis back on how conflict should be determined on Wikipedia. It was absolutely amazing how passionate this group of people are. And then we took exactly the same survey, and we asked administrators, these, uh, these are a different group of people on uh, Wikipedia, the first 50 people that we sampled from the uh, administrator pool, which is at the time ranked about a thousand people in the world. And we just took exactly a survey and asked them for the same opinion. And immediately we got, this is a spam, you guys shouldn't be doing this on Wikipedia. And in fact, uh, after a couple of weeks, we actually had one Wikipedia administrator uh, resign from uh, administratorship uh, in protest. Um, and so one of the things that we realized is that you, it, uh, Wikipedia is attracting all kinds of people, people who want to help out with the arbitration, uh, it's also attracting people that more or less are kind of um, almost function sometimes like ho uh, high school hallway uh, monikers. You know, they're kind of frustrated and they just you know want to look for trouble whenever they can. Um, so kind of an interesting uh, uh, comparison of the kinds of people that we end up at at Wikipedia. So, anyways, uh, so this was our early research, and uh, one of the things that we started thinking about is that if you're working on augmented social cognition, you couldn't just you know, do characterization. You actually have to try and see if you can build new social applications and see if they have any effect. So one of the ideas that we have is this idea called the living laboratory. And uh, here, um, I really have to give kudos to my PhD advisor um, from many eons ago, who um, uh, my PhD advisor is by the name of John Rito at the University of Minnesota, who's fairly well known in the in the HCI and, and other fields, uh, CSCW field, for uh, working on an idea called collaborative filtering. And he has this website called Movie Lens. Maybe some of you have even used it. Um, and the idea that he had was, you know, if you really want to do research on social collaboration or social applications of this type, what you have to do is build a community, and then you go and try and study it. And, um, and so he runs this Movie Lens service for free on the web and uh, um, he uses it as a research platform, basically, to uh, develop and test things. And so we're just starting to do some of that. And so I want to tell you about um, a thing that we just released about a month ago on the internet. And so you can go to wikidashboard.com or wikidashboard.park.com. Either one of those would get you to the right place. And um, the idea here is that after we did all that work trying to understand conflict and coordination, um, we realized that people, despite what Steve Carroll has to say about Wikipedia being the best information source out there, um, there are a lot of problems with Wikipedia. Um, people worry about whether the information there is actually factual, whether it's accurate, what are the motives of the editors. I mean, if you wonder about that, just go on the politics page, especially on the presidential election pages. Uh, you're really worried about the, some of the people who go on there and, and spend a you know, large amount of their time. And I'll show you some examples of that and what their motivations are. Okay. And um, there's issues about the people who are writing it. You know, what, what are their expertise? What makes them qualify to tell me something about the information entropy? Or what qualifies them to tell me something about calculus? Um, and uh, there's this issue about stability. A lot of the content seems to be constantly being in flux. 
So you know, if it's in flux and I'm there and I'm looking at the information at that moment, how do I know that I hadn't just stumbled upon a version of the revisions where someone had just put in a bunch of false information, right? How do I know that, right? And uh, what about spotty coverage? Maybe it doesn't cover some of the topics that I want it to cover. Um, and maybe a lot of the citations on there are non-verifiable, you know? Where is the information coming from? People do a lot of cut and pasting from contents on the web. Uh, you remember in the early 90s when people said, you know, if it's on the web, it's got to be true, right? So now the new, new phrase is, if it's on Wikipedia, it must be true. Well, a lot of people don't think that's the case, right? So how do you go about um, dealing with these issues? So what we did was we just said, well, these are a lot of risks. And we don't really know how to understand how to attack all these different problems. Maybe we can just pick one of these and try and understand it. And so what we did was we pick uh, stability, volatility, and try and understand how does that affect um, Wikipedia. So the idea is that maybe what we can do is if we make all the communication on Wikipedia much more translucent, much more transparent to the people who are viewing those pages, and then you can increase the communication and collaboration and make the information much more salient and at least make people aware what kinds of uh, uh, activities are happening on there. And wikis is really a prime candidate for this because literally every single edit down to the single you know, comma that someone inserted because they really think that comma should be there or a semicolon needs to be there um, is logged and uh, retrievable for anybody to examine, right? So uh, that's why wiki has, uh, uh, Wikipedia has gotten so much uh, um, attention in the past, uh, recent past. And so Wikipedia, uh, wiki dashboard, the idea is that if you can surface these so hidden social context to the user, then, for example, for the reader, they can look at things like, are there any instant in the past that uh, indicate a sudden burst of volatility on this page that maybe I should be aware of and be concerned about? Who are the editors? Who are the major contributors to this article? Do, should I trust the, these guys? What are their motivations? What are their points of view? What are their expertise? Um, and the idea here is really to help readers judge the quality and the trustworthiness of the article without telling them how trustworthy it is. Just giving them the social information to, to make the decision for themselves. And then for the writers, um, they would like to be able to have some measure of their own expertise, how much contribution that they have made, and motivate them to be more active and more responsible on the, on, on, on the, uh, on the page. So, here I'm going to um, try and defy, uh, uh, defy Murphy and actually give you a live demo. Uh, so if you go to wikidashboard.com, uh, uh, you'll, uh, you, you'll find a page that looks like this. And if you go down here and you click on Start Here, um, you uh, get to the main Wikipedia page, uh, wiki dashboard page. And um, as you can see, this is just an overlay on the, uh, on the actual Wikipedia. And you're looking at a live version of Wikipedia. There's nothing uh, non, not adulterated, right? And uh, up here, you have a little chart that tells you how much activity uh, has been happening uh, on this particular page and uh, who are the major editors are on this particular page. And you can literally go to any of these pages. So for example, uh, Larry's Creek, and you can find out that, uh, I can't quite read it on this, so what's this guy? Rule, rule, rule Fish has been the major editor on this page, and he apparently is the only passionate person about this topic. <laughs> so, you know, at a glance, very quickly, you can find out who's been passionate about this topic, what they've been doing, and this guy has been very passionate about it for actually the last year and a half. Um, interesting, I don't know what Larry's Creek is is worth, uh, maybe he lives right next to it or what, uh, what not. But uh, uh, so, you know, let's go on to some of the more perhaps controversial topics. So for example, Hillary Clinton, uh, you may or may not be uh, a fan of hers, but certainly it, it's interesting to you perhaps that uh, at one point in time, uh, the highest number of edits that happened here uh, was, I um, can't quite see. So the total number of edits here is 6,270 edits. And the number of talk 
edit has been 1,254, and that uh, there's some volatility right around this period, and then there's been some sort of steady uh, uh, conversation ever since that. And you have this one guy named With the Time R, uh, who has been very passionate about Hillary Clinton, and so you wonder about, you know, what's he up to? So you click on him, and uh, you get actually that you see that he is the uh, number one contributor to Hillary Clinton's page. He has edited this page 762 times, which is 3.3% uh, 3 .3 of, uh, of all his edits. Right? And then you can see that he's also been very interested in Rudy Giuliani and Dixie Chicks. <laughs> so what gives him the uh, authority to write something about uh, Hillary Clinton is something that you have to wonder about. And Indeed, he is actually contributing 14.2% of all edits on this particular page. Okay, and then uh, you can go down the list here. You say uh, Mr. T. Vaz has contributed 167 edits uh, in his number three position. You can see that uh, he's been interested in not just um, uh, Hillary Clinton, but also he's very interested in Barack Obama, Cass Stevens, and John Lennon. So apparently, if you like music, you also like Democrats. <laughs> uh, but again, here you see a little pattern of the kinds of edits that are happening on this particular page uh, that he has contributed to these various different topics. Right, so you know, we can move on to um, other candidates here. So for example, Barack, uh, Barack Obama. Uh, at first, not a lot of interest, and boom, you know, roughly in the middle of 2006, uh, there's been a lot of activity, and recently that's been dying down a bit. Uh, but again, uh, we see Mr. T. Vaz is, uh, is, uh, is involved here, and so you can go onto his page. You can kind of figure out who he is and whether you really want to trust him and why not. Yeah? Can I also ask him register several Wikipedia accounts? No, that is just, uh, expressively uh, not allowed on Wikipedia. And there's actually bots and people who are patrolling these kinds of things and find out who these uh, When you have more than one account, that's called doing a, a sock popping. And, and that's not allowed on Wikipedia. And people have been caught. Uh, there's actually pages. Uh, there's that user who shall remain nameless, uh, Forrest H2, uh, is the guy who quit in protest. Um, it, it turns out that after he quit in protest, he created 42 uh, sock puppets on Wikipedia and because he was so pissed off and he was kind of you know, causing trouble and whatnot. So, and he's been identified. And, for all those different sock puppets. And I think people use some form of uh, IP addressing, et cetera, to, to identify that. So anyways, um, that's the basic idea behind uh, Wiki Dashboard. And uh, so again, this is live on, on any page on Wikipedia. You can go on, find out your, your oh, actually, let's do that. Uh, let's find out Stan oh, man. Stanford. I never looked this up, so it'd be a nice little test of Murphy. There's Stanford University. Let's see how controversial it has been. What? Not very controversial, thank God. <laughs> okay, so that's the basic idea, right? And you can go and find out who this guy is and why he's here. No? Okay. All right. So. So that's the idea behind Wiki Dashboard, and uh, there's a little uh, whole uh, site that explains how this uh, whole site works. Okay, I'm looking at the time at 1.30, and I won't have time to go over this material, so I'll skip that. So I told you about the living laboratory, and uh, the idea that we're, we're trying to build these systems so that people can go and actually try things out. Another thing that we've been uh, very interested in is this idea called um, paragraph level tagging. And uh, the reason for this is actually uh, a, a somewhat of an academic one, which is that um, many people in trying to understand collaboration spaces have been trying to understand what is the what they call the participation architecture on the web. And that is that is, what motivates people to actually uh, contribute? And uh, there's some really interesting work in this space uh, by especially people who have been doing microeconomics and uh, behavioral economics work. Johann Binkler is probably the most well-known 
uh, researcher in this area has written some uh, really influential papers uh, in, this, in, in this area and that I've been just trying to digest. He writes these trustees that are 42 page journal papers that takes forever to read. Um, but one of the things that, um, that are kind of a, a, a hypothesis, if you will, right now is that the fact that if I, if I keep the cost of participation really high, then I will have uh, a lot less number of people who would uh, participate. And if I were to dramatically lower that cost of participation, make it into a uh, you know, couple of second kind of interaction, kind of like Wikipedia, don't force people to register, then I will have a lot more people who are willing to contribute to the content, right? So uh, the idea is, first of all, by reducing the cost, how do we actually increase participation? Is it exponential? What does that equation look like? The other is, how do we actually decrease the interaction cost? So one of the things that, uh, 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 let me do a, another demo here. Uh, one of the things that is really annoying about the um, can I have the, oh, already there. So one of the things that uh, you might be interested, you have been using might be uh, this thing called delicious. And so let's say, for example, if I, what's going on? Oops. I click on the wrong thing here. Okay. So if I say I want to bookmark this, uh, this page, I click on delicious, and I say, okay, this is, some editor on Wikipedia that I wanted to remember, and then I type return. So you know, the, the fact that I have to type um, takes time. The fact that I had to, rem I, already I have forgotten how we ended up th on this page. Oh, this, that's right, this is the editor on Stanford. So that's a, so I should bookmark this and I say, uh, Stanford uh, editor Wikipedia, right? And I click on save. And there, I have bookmarked it. Right? So um, the fact that this is a cognitive operation is really expensive. And so the idea that we had was, why not make this a little easier? So for example, let's say the, we're on this uh, blog called TechCrunch. And I say, uh, I am interested in uh, maps, mashups, uh, the fact that this is a vehicular mashup, that sounds kind of interesting, and I'm kind of done with that. And so like that, oh, Zylo. I'm always interested in news about Zylo because real estate around here is so expensive. <laughs> um, so now I read the next one, Flock. Oh, that sounds interesting. Flock has been released. So let me highlight that. Download. And I can also type in here, so Flock. Uh, web browser there so that's the idea is that instead of forcing people to go on to a different page let's use Ajax and whatnot to make the interaction much simpler and uh, this is the idea behind uh, uh, Spartacus and so for example we can go on uh, today's talk and say okay for many years community sounds interesting information environments Social forager, that seems like a keyword. Um, park, oops, social web, and there you go. I've bookmarked this. And uh, if I were to go over to my, uh, my reading notebook here, uh, you'll see that uh, it now has bookmarked those paragraphs for me. And, um, and I can also go on to other people's, my friend's uh, uh, reading notebook and find out what they have been reading and what they have been tagging, what they have been highlighting. And uh, so this is the idea behind Spartacus, roughly. And um, this is a brand new thing that Park is releasing soon, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's called Spartacus. And so the idea here is that you have some sort of in situ while you're reading tagging while you're reading, and uh, there's no new windows. You tag by tagging, uh, type by clicking as instead of typing, and that uh, you have both tagging and highlighting capabilities all in, all in one go, right? So, and in fact, one of the ideas here is that you tag not the destination. One of the problems with Delicious is that you're tagging 
a, a URL. You're not tagging the content. So tag crunch, for example, gets changed every day. And so if you tag that URL, the next time you go back is actually a different content. So what we're trying to uh, tag is actually the paragraph, not, not some, uh, not some uh, 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 destination, not some URL. So for example, if we were to tag a paragraph here, and when you move on to a different, uh, a different page, if it's the same paragraph, Spartacus actually still attached those tags and those highlights for you. Okay. So in fact, that has turned out to be really handy for syndicated contents. So AP, for example, creates all these news articles that are carried all over the country on different websites and different uh, people. And uh, so when you go to the same content, as long as the paragraph are the same, Spartacus notices this by a, a fingerprinting method, basically. And, uh, and it says the tag should be attached to those paragraphs. So that's kind of a neat little, little feature. Yeah? So if you start taking content from multiple sources and putting it together into a new place, if that's for profit, isn't there legal implications of that? I don't you mean think as far as copyright and that sort of things? Right. So you're putting the information together in a new way. Yeah. And so, so the, the, that's an interesting question, and, and there's a lot of services that are out there now do this. So Google Notebook, for example, enables you to go on any web page, and you can cut and paste a, a paragraph out of there and put it into your, into your research notebook, so to speak. Our idea here is the same. You know, it's, it's, it's simply a, a, a reading notebook of the things that you come across. It's not for wholesale copy, copying of the entire page. So wider audience, right? And that's true on Google Notebook as well. So, far, been so yeah, you know, with any time these kind of new digital technology is going to start pushing on boundaries of issues of IP and copyright and things like that. But we do believe this falls under some form of fair use uh, in this particular case. Um, so anyways, uh, I told you about the uh, uh, reading notebook. And uh, the idea of the social sharing here, where if I have, uh, you can actually add people, in, for example, in your research group as your friends. And now you can see actually their tags on the reading that they have been doing. So many of us at Park, for example, read TechCrunch. And so oftentimes, when someone has already annotated it, uh, it helps me actually quickly digest that piece of, uh, of information. So this is an idea that we basically is kind of like an importance indicator. So before you've even read the page, if one of your friends has been to that page and actually annotated it, um, that gives you an importance indicator of areas in which you want to pay attention to. And um, this idea in itself, uh, we have no IP in this space. And it, some of you might remember um, in the early, early, early days of, of, of the web, there was this uh, uh, company called Third Voice. Um, that was essentially doing kind of a version of this. And uh, this is kind of having a resurgence recently. Um, and you can imagine that there's a lot of controversy, especially because you're now actually sometimes you know, placing highlights is just one thing. But you can imagine having other kinds of annotation where people start actually writing a little, perhaps have a little dialog box that gets attached to the page. And people maybe can leave uh, a picture, maybe leave a voice imprint. And so you're actually changing the look and feel of the page itself. And you know, what, what does that do to the, to the reader and, and, and their consumption of the material? So that's the kind of thing that we're doing with the Living Laboratory. Um, we're just at the beginning of this. The group just got formed in April. And uh, we've been working on these kinds of things. And um, we're hoping that uh, Spartacus will become live in the next six months or so and that people will actually be able to try them out. And, uh, but right now you can go and try out uh, Wiki Dashboard uh, if you're a Wikipedia enthusiast. So um, with that, um, I'll use that as a, as a way to um, finish up. Um, augmented social cognition is this research area that we're trying to, to start going from understanding social foraging to social sense making. The research vision that we're trying to go after is to understand how social computing systems could really enhance the ability of a group of people to remember, think, and reason. And we're doing this by both characterization of the space as well as using this idea of the living laboratory to create these kinds of applications that people 
uh, can use to harness the collective intelligence to do knowledge capture, to transfer them, and to actually do knowledge discovery. So with that, uh, thank you very much for coming and paying attention. I'd be happy to take some questions if there are any more and uh, if more people want to come up. Hey, Dan. Hey, uh, that was a great talk. Um, Thanks. I like the clip from The Office. It actually reminded me of uh, the Colbert Report. Stephen Colbert had a thing on Wikipedia. Uh, and I think the tagline was, the revolution will not be verified. And uh, what he said was, together we can all create a reality. Or, together we can create a reality we all agree on, the reality that we just agreed on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what, what he's touching on is that um, you can have 300 minor edits, right? And then you can have one edit that blows it all away, right? And uh, I think the, the, um, the, you know, the visualization you showed is great because you can see all, you know, all the different edits that people have made over time and everything. But um, the problem is that uh, you, you don't really know beyond the fact that it was edited. Um, it's hard to know yes. how sort of... Right found those edits were. And what it made me think of was there's a, you probably know the wiki scanner project mm -hmm. that it uncovered a lot of these really great uh, sort of shameful wiki yeah. spin jobs like Exxon Mobil, you know, the leading statistics about habitat destruction after the Valdez spill and stuff. And and that kind of stuff wouldn't really come through in that type of big debate. Right. So it kind of can expose controversy but not really bias of the editors. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really have a great like suggestion for that, but it might be cool if there'd be some way to visualize, for example, minor edits versus major edits versus reverts. Right. Um, we 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 spent some time thinking about this problem, and uh, we ended up with just you know we really want to get this tool out there for so that people can use it, and so we just picked the easiest one to do. But actually, w what we've also done is um, we just recently implemented the the Hadoop, uh, the um, Notch uh, computation system uh, on a forty workstation machine cluster that we have at Park, and we're actually computing the diff between all the revisions, the 58 million revisions, well that's actually summer of 2006, so 2007 right now, I think we have over 100 million, 100, probably 120 million revisions now, and we're actually computing the diffs between each successive edit on Wikipedia now, on, this, on these set of 40 machines, and so we'll actually be able to give you not just the, the edit count, that this person has edited 1,042 edits, but we'll actually be able to tell you that net result, this guy added this many and deleted this many, and et cetera. Um, so you can get to more fine grain, at least more reductionist metrics that tell you more, but the problem that I haven't been able to wrap my head around, and I think this is something where uh, maybe people here have some ideas about, is the fact that the value of the edit it's not actually in the number of words, it's not in the number of edit counts, it's actually in the idea that has been put in there, right? So I could maybe just make edit of two words, but they might be the most profound thing that I've ever said, right? So how do you measure something like that? Seems really difficult to me. And it seems to me that at some point you might have to go down to some sort of human judgment of the value of the edit. And that, maybe you can use some sort of mechanical Turk-ish, maybe you can do some sort of <laughs> Uh, uh, collaborative filtering-like technique where um, each person now starts to give value, kind of like on eBay, you know, give value onto the other person, how, how valuable was this edit really, and maybe have some sort of voting system on the reputation, et cetera. And I think Wikipedia is kind of starting to move toward this direction. There was um, uh, this really interesting research project from UCSC, uh, UC Santa Cruz, of um, the idea of uh, actually uh, uh, coloring the words according to how many times that word has been edited, or, uh, added and removed, mm -hmm. et cetera. So the disability and et cetera. So basically also, also coloring according to the reputation of the user who has, who has made that edit. So these are all kinds of ideas that maybe we can actually enhance the metrics that you're talking about. But um, I think in the end though, we need to get to something that is not just a machine computed metric but rather something that is uh, a, a human judgment. Yeah. Um, there is a website uh, of a service called Search Engine Watch. Yeah. That one of the articles was Wikipedia itself is a very good search engine. Uh, 
because a lot of uh, other web pages refer to that. So by looking into the referral of other pages, um, especially pages on other websites that are on the same subject to a page, and measuring how those things change relatively to revisions can give you an indication that the experts only feel that a web a page on Wikipedia lost its credibility. Mm -hmm. So they stopped referring to it or increased the reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's actually been some really innovative ideas that are starting to bubble up about how to use the fact that Wikipedia has now become this really interesting knowledge space, and, and, and you searching through it uh, seems to be very profitable for people. Um, in fact, uh, I think, at least for me personally, I don't know about you guys, uh, uh, because I know there's all this sensitivity about using Wikipedia sources uh, on in academic environments or whatnot. So I think all the students love it, and all the professors seem to hate it, but Scott was probably an exception to that. But I know when I, whenever I search on Google, um, I often, if I see Wikipedia in the, in the list, that's the one I click on, um, just to get a very quick gist of what's going on there. So I think you're absolutely right that the search engine people are starting to pay attention to the fact that these kinds of sources can be much better information sources than other things that are out there. Um, I, I'm not an entire, you know, wholesale Wikipedia supporter, but it does seem to have its value. And um, the fact that, uh, the fact that uh, uh, so many Wiki, uh, Google searches seems to be coming up with Wikipedia articles seems to suggest to me that actually Google is probably actually making a lot of money off of, off of Wikipedia. Um, it's sad that Wikipedia itself is not making some money off of this because they're really having trouble uh, keeping up with uh, the amount of you can imagine the amount of traffic they're getting if they have a seven, eight percent daily reach, uh, and that's that's a hefty bandwidth bill. I don't care who you really are, you know. And so um, there, there is a lot of. It, it seems to me that there is a lot of interesting thing that can be done, both from a pro for-profit and non-profit perspective on search engine improvements, etc., through through this kind of social uh, knowledge space building. Then again. Yeah, actually, touching on what you said, there's actually an article in the last communications of the ACM by a history professor at Middlebury College, who, and the article is called Why I Don't Allow My Students to Cite Wikipedia. He had yeah. found all these, uh, in, he found the consistent incorrect information in all of these papers. And, mm -hmm. But then he caught all this flag for banning Wikipedia and decided he needed to justify himself. In the so I, I will say one more thing about that. In fact, in the, in the announcement to the web, uh, at least to a Wikipedia uh, community, uh, about Wiki Dashboard, we actually cited that case. We said, you know, there's this guy from Mil Middlebury in the history department that says Wikipedia should not be used at all in any sort of academic research, right? And what's interesting about this is that oftentimes the arguments that I've heard about the fact that Wikipedia is not a good academic source is because it is not uh, a peer review source. It is not an authoritative source. It, anybody can edit anything. Well, the interesting thing about that to me is that in academia, that is exactly the case. That is also peer reviewed, right? I mean, in Wikipedia, it's peer reviewed in the sense that anybody can go to it and says, I don't agree with this, or I think the information here is wrong. And then you can, if you don't like it, you can go and change it, right? That's the essence of sort of, in a way, peer review. That's the idea in which all academic research is built on. If, you, if someone published a, a, a statement in a medical journal that you don't agree with, you can go do an experiment and refute that. The other thing that I think is really interesting is the fact that it says, well, you can't verify anybody's credential. Well, the reality of that in academic circles is really true as well. If I want to publish a paper with a false name, with a false institution, does anyone really, has anyone ever really called me up and says, are you really Ed Chi and are you really publishing this paper? I think it would be easy, actually, in an academic journal to publish a paper. Just get a P.O. box somewhere. <laughs> you can probably publish an academic paper with a different name. So it's not clear to me that, Wiki that academic environment really operate that differently from Wikipedia. It's just the dynamics is different. So I'm not, I'm not, I think this debate needs to move forward in a more constructive way than just saying that Wikipedia sucks because anybody can edit anything. You know, that's, that's not a very constructive way to, to move this conversation forward. So that's my rant. <laughs>
question for you, which is sort of an opinion question. Of one, one, one source of controversy on Wikipedia is whether an article should exist at all, basically whether the topic yes. has merit, particularly with people, because Wikipedia doesn't want people just making vanity pages about themselves. Right. Um, so they have to have some sort of notability criteria. And I became aware of this because there's a Wikipedia page about me, uh, and, there, and there probably isn't one about you. Maybe there is. I don't know. But it, it seems like that's... Maybe like, you're that's, more notable than I am. It's messed up, right? <laughs> there's something weird there. And so the question... And who decides? Right. right, who decides it? Yeah. And so I think that they, what they've sort of gone with is based on how much you've been written up in traditional print media. But the thing is that is Wikipedia that a good is... metric? I don't know. See, yeah. I don't think that's necessarily the right metric. I'm just thinking maybe some of your metrics called, for example, the number of unique contributors, or there might be other kinds of interesting metrics to use to decide on a person's notability. What's neat about Wikipedia is the fact that these kinds of processes are determined on a community basis. So in a way, you know, if you don't agree with it, you'd have, you, you can try and see if other people will move toward your version of what you think should be the metric, right? And you can try and affect social change that way. What's, what's a little distressing about it is the fact that Wikipedia is now such an institution that it has, it's sort of set in its own way. You know, it's kind of like, are we really sure that democracy is the best governance model? Maybe there is a better model that we don't know about, but it seems to be the one that we've settled on that seems to sort of works. And maybe it's not perfect, but at, le at least it's one that seems to be working. And so um, there's a lot of, there were a lot of momentum to move things forward, but now it seems to me at least that Wikipedia is kind of set in its way about the policies and et cetera. In fact, one of the administrators that we surveyed gave us this beautiful quote saying that the degree in which you can move article in one way or in one direction or another is really your ability to cite procedures and precedent. And that reminded me a lot of a profession called lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's very interesting that there's this whole governance model. People are talking about having a wiki legislature on Wikipedia, et cetera. And it just, it's, it's a very highly politicized environment and, and is at a point where, you know, think about a, me, a little guy, trying to change the way America is governed, that's going to be very difficult. And it's just the same thing. Wikipedia now has become an institution. One guy trying to change the way it's being governed is going to be somewhat difficult. So there's all these really interesting, I think you can, if you're a political science major, I think there's a whole interesting experiment that you can be doing on Wikipedia-like spaces. I think there were other comments that people wanted to. Yeah. Oh, one, sorry. One philosopher was asking, was asked, what he thought of Western civilization, and he thought, well, that would be a good idea. <laughs> uh, but my thought here was that in the old days, if you really wanted to add to human knowledge, you had to write a book, mm -hmm. roughly speaking, uh, the effort of a year. And uh, 10 years ago, if you wanted to add to human knowledge, you had to write an article for a journal. And that's, you know, months' work at least. Right. And now, if you want to add to human knowledge, you can go to Wikipedia and in half an hour you can do something. Right. And provided that other people agree with it enough not to take it away, you have added to human knowledge. One of the interesting things that, about what you're saying is that uh, we're starting to discover that perhaps publishing academic papers is not the best way to have impact, actually. Um, our blog gets lots of views and, you know, I mean, that might be the better way to disseminate information. Uh, so th this Web 2.0, as buzzy as a word it might sound, is changing the way the information is being disseminated. And that's really what we're talking about. It's not all these buzzy technology or whatever it is. It is about the information environment and the fact that it is changing and that having impact does not just mean publishing in uh, journals and publishing in, in, uh, in uh, traditional media. Uh, but that means having an effect on the online world is really kind of what you're speaking to. I think there was, did you say there was one over here? Okay. Yeah. People are largely good at, I think, uh, eBay and uh, Wikipedia, those kind of business models mm -hmm. uh, affirm this idea. But um, to, as things go on, we should, uh, to lift the whole human knowledge, we should encourage people with more substance to contribute to this kind of open forum, but I don't see a way that people really have a lot of substance or prestige in a certain area. They don't, they're usually busy, they want to make more money. Yeah. They don't spend time on these kind of things. 
I think that's a very important thing that we haven't addressed. I haven't seen anything. And that's kind of in a way why I made that comment. You know, there's uh, the, the, the people who are busy, they are publishing in academic journals that are actually not accessible to everybody. You know, I mean, there are a lot of journals that often I want to get a copy of, and I go on the journal website and I click on it and it says, oh, would you please pay $35? And I was like, well, I'm not so sure that information is really that valuable for me to pay $35 when there's all this free information that are out there, right? So I think the whole publishing industry is starting to wake up in this area. I think you were talking uh, sort of in relation to that. The fact that the best way to disseminate information is not these traditional ways. And so at what point do academics wake up, you know, such as myself? Uh, we still need places like Kai. We still need journals like Tokai to have some major authority. You know, I, I put my resume out there and you can anybody can go and look at it and says, oh, why is this guy qualified to come here and talk to a room full of about 80 people? You know, and they can go and examine it. And then, oh, the fact that this guy published papers and Kai published paper in C CSCW or whatever, those kinds of things somehow gives me a th some authority, right? But at least according to Wikipedia community, Dan is more notable than I am, right? So it is this uh, interesting question about, you know, where do people get information and how do you have impact? And I think that's really fundamentally the force that's at work that is really changing the way that information is being disseminated. And um, so we'll see what happens. Maybe in the future, the best way to publish your research paper is on Wikipedia. There's one. one. <laughs> I think I'll take one more if, if you can somehow combine, because I know 2 o'clock is our hard stop, right? So I'll take one more uh, in the back here. So, I mean, you were talking about impact, and you know, you, it, Wikipedia, I'm sure it has a, you know, it gives you a lot of scope to have high impact. But maybe it's just a person who graduated me. I've seen the way social networks have evolved, and you know, a lot of social networking sites, a lot of forums, Wikipedia, the past couple of years. And personally, you know, what it seems to me is, you know, you're essentially buying down uh, the internet to mass of people. <coughs> It's, it's sort of, you know, an internet socialism or demo uh, communism or something like that. <laughs> I, I have no offense to people who believe in that stuff. But <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the way I've seen it, you know, now society evolves, science evolves, you know, human knowledge evolves. You take uh, anything, a wide set of beliefs that we hold to be true today might not be true tomorrow, right? And the media as such will not allow those to be changed because the bulk of the people believe in that. So, for example, you move Wikipedia to something like 600 years ago, and you know you have someone saying the Earth is round there, and you know it never gets on Wikipedia, right? So, similarly, there might be some beliefs out there today, you know, that would be validated in the future. But it'll never get on Wikipedia because right. everyone else doesn't believe in it. I think that's why it makes this research area so fascinating. Yeah. I think this is what makes this whole area so fascinating, is because. You know, this, it's the, I, I said at the beginning of my talk, right, I'm realizing that the information environment is not an individual information environment. It's a social information environment. Exactly. And so anything that is social inherently is going to have politics. It's going to have ins and outs. It's going to have what's included and what's not included, what's authoritative, what's not authoritative. And the question is, how do we decide all that? Wikipedia provides one model. Some people don't agree with it. And in fact, a lot of people have taken the Wikipedia content and started a different site. The, one of the co-founders of Wikipedia, I forgot his name, not Jin Yu, was the other guy, started a, a citizen, citizen, citizen Indian, right? And, and so in the different models of, of, of how to govern these things, and et cetera. So this is a giant experiment, basically. And Wikipedia has been a giant experiment. And it's amazing that it's worked at all. And that's why I find Steve Carell's uh, uh, comments so fascinatingly deep and funny at the same time. So. Um, but with that, I think uh, that's enough time. So thank you very much for staying. And for information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.